Hi, my name is David Markham. I'm a technical manager with Tarmac. And in this video, I'm going to explain how we make the aggregate we need to produce products like asphalt. The stone gets from the quarry face to the asphalt plant through a series of stages, basically blasting, crushing and screening. So here's a blast taking place. A quarry face is typically 15 metres high and depending on the size of the quarry, a blast will bring down about 30,000 tonnes of stone. This will range from large blocks all the way down to the smallest dust. Anything that won't fit through the first crusher or primary crusher could be sold as block stone. Otherwise, it will need breaking down to a size suitable for the primary crusher to take. The blast material is hauled from the face to the primary crusher in dumpers. This dumper has a capacity of about 90 tonnes of uh, material. Just before the primary crusher, it's likely that the blast stone will be passed over a scalping screen or grizzly deck. This is a means of diverting weaker stone away from the premium stone we want for products like asphalt. The, the logic is simple. Any weaker stone in the rock will be reduced to a smaller size by the force of the blast. So if you remove the smaller stone at this stage, you remove any weaker aggregate. Good quality scalpings might still be usable as type one sub base. Otherwise, they go for lower grade fill aggregates or just get sold as scalpings or in some cases builders sub base. Typically, scalpings will be a 40 mil down product with everything larger being sent into the premium stone process. So now we get to the crushers. There are a number of ways of crushing stone which broadly fit into impact and compression types. The choice of crusher depends on the stone type and is driven by the desire for high production, good aggregate shape and of course the cost of running and maintaining the crushers. Jaw crushers are only ever used in the primary stage and frequently with hard and abrasive stone like grit stone. Here you can see how the jaw crusher gets its name with one fixed and one moving plate. It's like your jaw in essence. Gyratory crushers can also operate in the primary stage as can rotary impact crushers. Gyratory crushers work in the same way as cone crushers, which we'll cover later, so we'll jump over these for now. But here's an example of an impact crusher running. Rotary impact crushers contain metal drums or rotors that spin at high speed, maybe three to 400 RPM, and both hit the stone entering the crushing chamber and throw it onto breaker bars inside, causing the stone to fracture. Rotary crushers are probably more common with slightly softer aggregates like limestone. Secondary crushing. So these are the stages of crushing after we've uh, been through the primary phase. So the, the face material is now crushed to something like a maximum 125 mil size down. And this goes along belts to secondary crushers. Before then, the stone might be further scalped to make high quality crusher run materials like type 1 sub base or 6F2, but that's not necessarily the case. Secondary crushers take the stone down to the size fractions needed for the final product like asphalt. Cone crushers are quite common in the secondary stage of processing. They operate by compression. In comparison to impact crushers, this is quite a slow moving process. Cone crushers consist of a metal cone and a bowl. The bowl is fixed and the cone moves up into the bowl but leaves a gap. The cone doesn't rotate but sits on an eccentric bearing that opens and closes the gap between the bowl and the cone. Stone drops down until the gap closes and it gets crushed and then falls out the bottom of the crusher. The final stage of crushing is tertiary crushing. And if this is used, this employs the fifth and final type of crusher, which is the, the VSI, standing for Vertical Shaft Impact Crusher. They're also known by the original manufacturer's name as Barmac Crushers, a bit like we call vacuum cleaners uh, hoovers. Here, the stone drops down through a rotating shaft until it hits the rotor head, spinning at very high speed. 
This throws the stone outwards to strike other pieces of stone, some of which have been diverted round the rotor, rotor deliberately. This stone on stone impact reduces wear in the crusher and also very effectively takes the edges of pieces of stone to produce the good cubical shape that we want for asphalt surface courses, particularly SMA type mixtures. The downside of bar mat crushers is that they can generate a lot of dust. At the end of all this processing, we screen the product into the final single sizes we need to make asphalt. That's dust, 6, 10, 14, 20 and 32 mil fractions. You only need those larger size fractions, of course, if you're generally producing binder course materials. So what we typically do in high PSV units particularly is process them down to the dust 6, 10 and 14 mil sizes. The split of sizes depends on the stone and the crusher configuration, but fairly obviously we can't flick a switch on the plant and make just 10 mil stone that day. We can take excess stone plus oversized material and recrush it, pass it back through stages of the crushing. But we can't um, split a 20 mil piece of stone neatly into two bits of 10 mil, I'm afraid. So at a grit stone quarry, we end up with something like the following split in sizes when we crush everything down to 14 mil stone or smaller. Because high PSV 20 mil is only really needed for pre-coated chippings, this size is often passed back through the crushing process, but this generates dust. So if there's a message from this section, it's about working between specifiers and asphalt producers to spread the load on single sizes to match an efficient crushing process. As an industry, we've ended up with a particular pressure on 10 mil high PSV stone what with SMAs and surface dressings. So when opportunities arise, Tarmac does try and offer six mil and 20 mil surface course alternatives. They bring their own benefits, be that low noise and reduced thickness or single course structural treatments. Each can have a place on roads, but it's important that we preserve high PSV rock sources in particular by working to balance demand with production. So please consider these materials when you're looking at schemes. Thanks for listening.